Hey, good morning, church. How are we today? That's good. For those who don't know me, my name is Josh, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Kellyville Church, and it's an honor to, to, do, to be a pastor here. And today, today I want to start off by playing a game, okay, with every single person here sitting down. And the game I want to play has a clear answer, and if you have an answer, I have a sweet, sweet prize that I'm going to throw at you from the stage and pray that the Lord makes my aim true. Um, so on the screen, I have a couple of sample values from different organizations or companies from all around the world that we know from our day-to-day -day lives. And I want to see if anyone here can guess what the organization is based off the values that they have. Are we ready? All right, first one up, please, Lyndall. All right, first one, customer obsession, passion for invention, commitment to operational excellence and long-term thinking. Who is that? Anyone? Just shout it out. Apple? Incorrect. Google. Incorrect. Microsoft. Incorrect. Did someone say anything there? Five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. No, it's Amazon. There we go. I guess I get a muesli bar for myself. Boom. All right, second one. Organizational company number two. They value moving fast, focusing on long-term impact, building awesome things, living in the future, being direct and respecting colleagues. Does anyone want to guess? Not Google. Tesla. Not Tesla. Hint, we kind of use this as a social media platform. Facebook. There we go, Meta, sorry, but for those that are in, in the know, it's Meta now. That's Facebook's value, another one for me. Actually, no, someone said it, Aubrey. Uh, here you go. <laughs> All right, number three. Christ-like living, Christ-like communicating, Christ-like discipling, Christ-like teaching, Christ-like healing, Christ-like serving. Anyone know? Oh, perfect, the Adventist Worldwide Church. There we go. Amazing, there we go. Organization four, please, up on the screen. Uh, they value serving others, inclusion, integrity, community, and family. Did someone say Kellyville? Yeah. Wrong. Andra. Wrong. Andra. Not Kellyville. Salvo. Not Salvos. Andra. Not Adra. It's actually McDonald's. Oh. Isn't that interesting? I don't know about that servicing. Some customer service is pretty bad. And the integrity of those burgers? Mmm, interesting. All right, last company that I have on the screen. People, community, relevance, excellence, involvement, spirituality, integrity. No. <laughs> Good try, Bella. Anyone want to hazard a guess? No. I haven't heard it yet. Kellyville, great job, Jess. I would throw it, but I'll leave it here at the microphone stand. There we go. It's actually Kellyville's values. I'm missing a few because if I put a couple of extra, it would have given it away. But I wanted to see if people, people knew. And the reason why I wanted to play this little game is because values are important to any organization, any individual, on any level. Because just like a muscle and how a muscle is exercised, if values are exercised well, and true and right, then people notice. And so it's all fine and good to have values for an organization, but if we're not living the values that we swear to live by, or that we vow to live by, kind of like the Macca's ones, we don't really notice the company, or we don't really notice. And it's the same with the kingdom of God values. Jesus has a way that he wants his people to live, and he's laid it out clear in scripture and at Kellerville Church, we want to include the kingdom values in our church values because we want to embody the kingdom of God lifestyle that Jesus has for us here at this community. But if we don't exercise these values, just like muscles that don't get exercised, they slowly but surely wither away, and they're of no use for us whatsoever. And so today, the value that I want to talk to us about is the value of integrity. The value of integrity. Let's bow our heads. Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. May your spirit rest on us now. Teach us what integrity means. In your name I pray. Amen. 
One of, my one of my colleagues, Pastor Josh Dollars, he told a story at chapel the other day, and it was so good, I needed to copy and paste it into my sermon. So I'm giving him the footnote, I'm giving you guys the source material, but he was telling us a story about a builder. Now, there was a builder, and he was a really great builder, and he worked for a company, and he put around 40 good years at this company, and most mornings he'd wake up excited to go to work. Everyone knew that he was a good man and a good worker, never cut corners, and he always delivered an amazing product. But towards the end of his career, he started realizing that getting up for work was getting a little bit harder, lifting the timber was getting a little bit heavier, and he realized, all right, I need to finish up. It's time to, it's time to retire. I've, I've done a lot of work for this company. I need to just enjoy the rest of my life. And so we went to the company and he said, I'm up, I'm giving you my, my notice. And the company, they begged him, they said, please just stay for one more build. Okay, please, just, just one more, we just have one more house, and it's for one of the most important people that this company has ever had to, to serve before. And so the, the builder said, oh, okay, like, I guess I'll just do one more, one more. And so he started at the house, it was a beautiful location, and he noticed as every morning he woke up, it was just a little bit harder. And when, when problems came up at work, as they often do, instead of staying true and putting in a lot of effort like he normally does, he kind of started to cut a corner here and there. And eventually he started to cut a lot of corners. And to the point where he thought to himself, man, I'm glad that I'm not living in this house because I wouldn't trust the integrity of this house at all. And so by the time that he, he finished up, he thought, all right, it looks good on the outside, the company will have to deal with it later on after I'm gone, so I'm all good, you know? And so he came on his final day and all his employers were there and he said, all right, I'm done. And so they looked at him and they handed him the keys and they said, hey, this is your gift for all your work that you've done at our company. What a plot twist, right? My goodness gracious me. Integrity, that is what that man lacked. And that leads us into the question, what is integrity? My school principal, the one thing that I remember that he always used to drill down into our brains is integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Perhaps you've heard that before. As I was doing some research on the idea of integrity, integrity comes from the Latin word integras, which is equivalent to wholeness, the idea of wholeness. An integer in mathematics is a whole number instead of a fraction. And you guys know that I love my Hebrew. There were too many, there were a couple of Hebrew words to translate that are translated into the English word integrity. But the overall Hebrew idea for integrity is this. The condition of being without blemish, completeness, perfection, sincerity, soundness, uprightness, and there's that word again, wholeness. Integrity is wholeness. I like that idea. Jesus had a lot to say about the idea of integrity, especially on the Sermon on the Mount. And if you open up your Bibles with me to Matthew 5, verse 33 to 37, he actually has a very powerful thing to say about integrity for us here today. If you open up to Matthew 5, verse 33 to 37, Jesus says, again, you have heard that it is said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything else comes from the evil one. We've often read that Bible passage before, and we, you know, say that's why we don't take oaths anymore, that's why we don't take vows anymore, because that's what Jesus was talking about. But it was interesting digging a little bit deeper into the context of why Jesus said this thing. So back in Jesus' day, if you swore an oath, you were trying to convey the seriousness of either your innocence or the seriousness of what you were trying to convey. And so oath-taking was actually a normal part of, of everyday life for a, for a Hebrew person. But the thing is, you weren't allowed to swear an oath on God because you needed to respect God, 
but you, what you were able to do was you were able to swear an oath on things associated with God. That's why Jesus gave all these different things, you know, swearing by heaven, swearing by Jerusalem, swearing by your head. And the thing is, the closer that thing was associated with God, the stronger the argument that you were trying to make. So, hypothetical example, let's just say that Pastor Martin walked into our church office that Aubrey and I and Haley both all use, and it was a mess. If we were living in Jesus' time, and this has never happened before, Pastor Martin sends us a message on our pastoral WhatsApp group, hey guys, the office is a mess. What's the go here? And let's just say Aubrey, because we're living in, Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew times, he says to, she says to, to Martin, Martin, I swear by my head that I did not dirty the office. It was Josh. That was kind of like a, okay, it was a serious, like, all right, she's trying to convey her innocence. And then I see, and I'm righteously angry because I didn't clean the office, I, I, I didn't dirty the office, so I say, Martin, I swear by the city of Jerusalem that I did not dirty the office. It was Judah. i oh, sorry, it was Haley. <laughs> all right? And so Haley sees the message, and she's angry because she's like, no, I'm innocent here. And then she says, Martin, I swear by God's throne that I didn't do it. I'm sure it was Aubrey. And so the cycle goes around. And the more and more and the closer and closer things get associated with God and closer to God, the stronger that you were trying to convey your innocence, the more serious you were trying to be in order to convey that you were telling the truth. And Jesus associates this with evil. And he associates it with the evil one. And why does he do that? Because as Christians, Jesus doesn't want us to be people that have levels to our integrity. As Christians, Jesus doesn't want us to be people that have levels to our integrity. We're not to be people that have to manipulate others in order for us to make them believe us. And that's why Jesus says, let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. Because to live with integrity is to realize that the things associated with God were the way for the Hebrew people to convey the idea that he's close by. But Jesus wants us all to know that we're always living in the presence of God. So we don't need to swear on things associated with him to convey our innocence. No, no, no. Because we are always living in the presence of God, let our actions reflect that. And that is the idea of integrity. To have integrity is to live in the reality that we always live in the presence of God. So our actions should reflect that. People are integrity. They are the same publicly as they are privately. People of integrity, they keep their word even when it hurts. People of integrity are honest in their dealings, both personally and professionally. And people of integrity are not perfect by any means, but they admit and make amends when things go wrong. But this begs the question, well, what happens if we lack integrity? What happens if we're not living in the awareness of the presence of God in our life and our actions aren't reflecting that? And I want to read an extended quote to you by a man called Jerry White, which I thought was very interesting. Jerry White says, Integrity is important in the minor matters as well as the major ones. When we dig an ethical grave, it is not with a ditch digger, but with a teaspoon. One small choice at a time. A few plagiarized words, minor cheating on taxes, taking home supplies from the office, flirtations with a coworker, white lies, or even creating a false impression to impress a neighbor. If integrity is costly, then a lack of integrity is even more so. Quoting Jesus, he says, what good will it be for a man if he gains the world, if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his own soul? This passage is not only speaking of salvation, but of the life of the soul in this world. When we cho choose worldly gain over personal integrity, we sell out our souls, and any reward is sadly temporary. Any reward is sadly temporary. Over here, I have a beautiful thing of Jenga that Hannah has kindly and very carefully brought up onto the stage. And this, and this little piece of Jenga represents us as human beings. 
When God created us, he intended us to be whole. He created us out of the order and out of the chaos, and he created us to be whole people. But when we stop prioritizing God in our life, when we stop spending time in his presence, when we, when we fail to remember that we're always living in the presence of God, something happens, and we give ourselves over to the things that we think will make us happy, the things that we may not think are a problem, but are a problem. Those flirtations with a coworker, that cheating on our taxes, creating a false impression for our neighbor, lying when we're supposed to be telling the truth. I think you get the idea. The more we give ourselves over to lies, the more we give over ourselves to the things that wouldn't cut it in the presence of God, the more and more we lack the wholeness that God intended us to live. And the easier it is for us to fall, the easier it is for us to be built on unsure, uh, unsure and shakable foundations. And so if integrity is wholeness before God, then a lack of integrity is a lack of wholeness before God. And it's because we're not seeking him. When I took some time to reflect on my own personal integrity, I had to think, all right, what does the idea of integrity mean to me? I'll be honest. I was like, you know what, I'm pretty good. <laughs> and perhaps you're sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, I'm pretty good, because I think to myself, I pay my taxes, I don't really steal much from work, maybe the odd photocopying here and there, it is what it is. I think kingdom work, it's all for the kingdom. And I thought I was pretty good. If I was to give myself a rating, I would give myself a pass. I don't want to say a distinction or a high distinction because Haley might reveal some stuff. But as I was thinking about myself, I started to listen to Haley, and I started listening to the constructive feedback she was giving to me about who I am as a person. And she pointed out a few things to me, and she didn't, I didn't ask her to point this out, she just said it one day. And she said, Josh, you're a little bit negative. You know that? You're a little bit negative, and sometimes you're a little bit rude. And I was like, ooh, okay, interesting. That's, that's fair. And something happened to me a couple of weeks ago that made me realize maybe I'm not as whole as I think I am. We went to Stormco, and in order to go to Stormco, we needed a couple of bus drivers, and I went to get my heavy rigid, bus, uh, heavy rigid license. And so I was doing the course during the day, and as I was talking to my instructor, we were going to spend the whole day in the car together. And so I was thinking to myself, I don't want it to get awkward, I'll just, we'll just make some small talk and whatnot. And he was a really kind man from the Middle East, and he asked me, he said, what do you do? And I had a choice to make. I thought to myself, I don't want, if I say I'm a pastor, he might get a little bit weird and we might be in the car for a really long time, so I'm just going to tell him that I'm a counsellor. And so I told him, oh yes, so I'm, I'm a counsellor. And as soon as I said I was a counsellor, this deep shame hit me. This deep, deep shame hit me. Because I thought to myself, why am I ashamed of who I am? Why am I ashamed of a position that I have and a job that I have? And I thought to myself, man, if I was in front of my church congregation now, what would they think of me? If I was in front of my wife right now, what would she think of me? If, I was in, if God was there, what would he think of me? And that's the thing about integrity, he is there. And slowly but surely, I had to like somehow backtrack and, and I had to admit to him, actually, actually I'm not a counselor, I, I, I'm actually a pastor, you know, I just didn't want to make, make it weird. And it was... And it was it was interesting because as soon as he found out I was a pastor, he said, oh, awesome, and he just started having conversations to me about you know, religion and whatnot, and it was a great time, but I just thought to myself, maybe I'm not as whole as I thought I am. And it reminded me of a, um, a C.S. Lewis quote, you might know it, he says, he says this, no man knows how bad they are until they try to be good. Have you heard that before? No person knows how bad they are until they try to be good, and I think that is the same with integrity. No one knows how much they lack until you start to feel the cracks. And so I realized in preparation for this sermon, there are two responses that we can have to a lack of integrity. There are two responses that we can have to a lack of wholeness. One, 
we can try to piece ourselves back together. Like this Jenga model here, we can try to get the broken pieces, the holes that are missing in our lives, and we can try to piece ourselves back together. But we can't, because the reality is we're broken people. Broken people can't fix broken people. A broken thing can't fix a broken thing. And instead of leading to wholeness, it actually leads to, to more brokenness. It leads us to thinking that we can impress God with our efforts and that we can make God accept us because of the, the things that we're trying to do for him. But we'll always fail at that. We'll never be good enough for the love of God. And so that, that, work, that way won't work. And so the second path, and I think is the path that God wants us to understand, is that the good news of the gospel is that Jesus was pierced to make us whole. Isaiah 53, that famous Bible passage, for he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be made whole. And he was whipped so that we could be healed. See, the gospel of Jesus is that out of his wholeness, he wants to piece us together again. That is the good news of the gospel. In Ephesians chapter three, Paul reflects on the integrity of God. He says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That last part I love, that you may be full to the measure of all the fullness of God. See, in this passage, Paul is speaking about the integrity of God. Unlike human beings, God is whole. He's perfect, he's unchanging, he's unmoved, and he lacks nothing. And the promise of the gospel is that out of his fullness, God wants to fill us with what we lack to fill ourselves with the things that we try to find answers for in the world, but we get nowhere. To fill us with the sense of purpose that we're so longing to find in this world, but find in nothing or in temporary things. To fill us with the sense of identity that we try to find in maybe a partner, in a job, a career choice, in a hobby, but that never satisfies. God wants to, out of his fullness, fill us with his fullness. And that is the gospel. I love what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 to 24 says. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. And I love what the message says. It says, may God himself, the one who makes everything whole and holy, make you holy and whole, put together spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable, and if he said it, he'll do it. The NIV says it like this, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. See, if you want to be put together by God, the promise of scripture is not that he might do it. It's not that he will get to it. It's not that he, he, he'll, he'll try and fit you into his schedule. Now, the promise that Paul wants us to know is that if you want to give God a go, he is completely dependable and he will surely mold you and make you whole into the person that he wants you to be. Numbers 23 verse 19 says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he promised and not carried it through? See, the good news of the gospel church is that you will not be God's first failed project. The good news of the gospel is that you will not be God's first failed project. He is completely dependable and he will surely see it through. Kellyville Church, integrity is such an important part of the kingdom of God and for us as a church community. Because to have integrity is the greatest way that we can show love to those around us. See, yes, we may impress the people 
that come to our church with the beauty of our building, the quality of our live stream, the coffee cart at the front, but we're not called merely to impress the world. We're actually called to be agents of transformation in the world. And that's why integrity is a value of the kingdom of God. Because when what we teach, when what we preach aligns with how we live, then we are the greatest example to the world, the greatest witness to the world of the goodness of Jesus, the beauty of the gospel, and the wholeness and the life that he wants to give us and the rest of the world. And so in closing today, I want to ask the questions to you today. What does it look like for you to seek integrity in your life? Do you need to seek the presence of God to make you whole? Do you need to ask, help me? Because he will surely do it. Do you need to stop searching for the things in this world that, are tri- that you're trying to fill the gaps in your life with? that seem to fit for a moment, but as time goes on, you see that they were sadly temporary? Do you need to stop pretending to be someone that you're not? Whatever it is, the promise that Paul speaks in in 1 Thessalonians is that God is faithful. He will surely do it. He is completely dependable. Let's pray. I thank you, Jesus Christ, that you are good. I thank you, Jesus Christ, that out of your fullness you fill us. That is the beauty of the gospel. And I pray, Jesus, that everyone here, everyone listening online, that we, Jesus, may know, that we may experience, that we may believe the good news that you're patient with us, that you forgive us, and that out of your fullness you want to make us whole. Lord, show us the parts of our lives that have holes. Show us the parts of our lives that we're giving away to things and lies that we think will make us happy but won't. And instead, Jesus, help us to bring ourselves to you and to ask you for the help to be the people you want us to be. To ask you to show yourself to us that we may experience for ourselves that you are completely dependable, that you will surely do what you set out to do, that you are not a liar, that you have not failed to act. Be with us, Lord. Guide us and lead us. In your name I pray. Amen. Amazing. Thank you, Pastor Josh. Church, let's stand and sing one last time today.
see a raise of hands who was blessed today. I am so blessed. Just the reminder of values. I don't know if anyone has even just values for your own life. I'm sure we all have values that we have at work, that we all have to uphold. But what about values we have in our own life and what we want to uphold? So thank you, Pastor Josh. That was such a great reminder of God and His steadfast love for us and how much we can depend on Him and what integrity um, looks like for us and how we should be showing integrity. It really reminded me of um, this week, uh, um, I was on a 
bus with the bus driver and uh, he saw my foot go like that when I was next to him and he's like, haha, are you pretending to drive and put the foot on the brake? And I do it to this guy all the time as well in the car. And to me, I'm just like, wow, I'm a terrible driver. And, you know, I just love to judge other people as well and their driving skills. So thank you, Pastor Josh, that I should be showing integrity in those little things as well. Because I think I'm perfect, but I know I'm not. So thanks, Pastor Josh, again. Uh, yeah, to all the visitors, um, there is the guest service uh, table out there. So uh, yeah, we'd love to talk to you and meet you. Um, and yeah, grab a coffee lid to the coffee cart and you'll skip the line. And uh, yeah, we will continue with connect groups. And then after that, there is lunch and lots of curries, I've been told. So yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a happy Sabbath and thank you to those people watching online. Have a great and blessed day.